It is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, a partner and business advisor with MNP, Mr. Eddie Borello. Eddie has over 30 years of experience and works with private company entrepreneurs, such as myself, <laughs> in the areas of corporate and personal taxation. He provides strategic business advice to help make informed decisions for individuals and their businesses. Many of Eddie's clients include engineering consulting firms. Today, Eddie will share his experience and his voice tailored to our industry and will take questions at the end for all the attendees. He also will speak, hmm, this is interesting, on the controversial tax reforms produced by or proposed by the uh, federal liberal government uh, recently this summer. So please help me in welcoming this morning's keynote speaker, Mr. Eddie Borello. Thank you very much. Good morning. How is everybody? Well, I saw the partying going on at the short club when I got in last night, and my son's also an engineer. And uh, he forewarned me. He goes, Dad, you got to watch the, uh, you know, the drinking and the inauguration type of things. And I go, what are you talking about? And he goes, remember, when they bring out the big bucket with the big blue dye, don't put your arm in it. It takes weeks to get it off. So I'm sure many of you will remember that. Anyway, this is an interesting time. First of all, uh, we have a lot to discuss about tax reform. I don't want to make all my comments on tax reform because I know you're going to the Hill tomorrow to talk with the MPs and talk about how you can make a difference. Your industry is obviously uh, very fragmented, you know, although dominated by four large players in Canada and pretty well much in North America, it still consists almost two-thirds of business owners, private enterprises, family businesses still make up the bulk of the engineering consulting practices that we see today. And a lot of my clients are in that private space. And tax reform, so-called tax reform, is going to have a direct impact on what you do. So I want to spend a little bit of time to talk a little bit about some of the industry trends that we're seeing in our practice and amongst our clients, and then talk about how these tax changes. And this week has been a pretty uh, momentous moment. A lot of changes has happened this past week, and I just want to highlight some of these things as to how they may impact you. But clearly what we're seeing, in, in, in definitely in Canada, right, that there's been a bit of a slowdown. I think the peak of 2011, 2012 is now distant memories for many of our companies. You know, we've seen revenues kind of peter out, a little bit of growth, profitability has been a little bit on the slide since the years of 2011, 2012. And maybe now we're at the low point and it's on the verge of coming back. Tomorrow morning, there's an economic statement that's gonna come out by our friend Bill Morneau and his, and his group. He's promising that there's gonna be wind in our sails, that we're gonna have a lot of growth coming in the next couple of years. And I'm sure a lot of that's gonna come out of government spending. We're gonna see a lot of government spending in infrastructure, although they've always promised us $40 billion you know, over the next 10 years for that spend. That growth rate could be about 3% going forward. And typically what we've seen is the growth of consulting engineering companies kind of parallels the growth of our GDP in Canada. So hopefully the prospects are going great. Our friends down south supposedly have a lot of money to have to rebuild infrastructure. Although their administrative policy is far from clear. At least I haven't looked at the latest tweet from uh, our friend Trump down south, because I think that's the only way you can actually glean what their administrative policy down in the US is. But if he holds true to his thoughts, they get tax reform in the U.S., which is a significant threat for Canada. They may have that infrastructure spend that they may need to do down south. Globalization is proving to be a bigger problem than ever before. I reflect back 10 years ago or so, where our local clients, our engineering clients, only competed with themselves or those in the, in the regional area. And yet now, competition comes from everywhere. Every parts, every corner, in every nick and crack of the world for engineering services. Construction services as well. The projects have gotten significantly larger. And as such, the risk comes back to you. And what we see along many of our engineering clients is they're trying to build some cash reserves, dry powder, as we often say, 
We're building dry powder to help mitigate those risks that have been pushed back to you. The tax reform proposals may not help you continue to build those cash reserves. And we'll talk about that in a second. So what are we seeing in, the, in, the tough, in, in our industry is tougher marketplace, increased competition. Pricing is becoming an issue. You know, profitability has slightly slipped over the last little bit. And we're seeing more and more companies trying to mitigate their risks by trying to build up these cash reserves overall. Costing has become a paramount importance for all the organizations. Not only costing about what it costs to deliver the services uh, you know, for, for those projects that you're endeavoring, but also costing in responding to RFPs that you often get in your industry. And the RFPs are becoming more and more costly and the risk of success is becoming less and less because of the increased competition. And as such, mitigating that cost, hopefully to increase your chances of success, tends to be an issue we see amongst many of our clients in terms of how do you mitigate that. Mergers and acquisitions, it's not gonna go away. It has slowed down. I would say the whole merger activity, consolidation in the industry, five years ago was rampant. Now it's kind of slowed down. Slowed down partly in response to what's happening probably throughout our country. You know, while oil prices fell, the folks in the oil sands business and the energy sector out, out west have had a tough time. And so they're not interested in selling. They're hoping to rebound by being far more profitable. Why sell at such a low price? Now, I do think mergers and acquisitions will gain some steam over the next couple of years, without a doubt. Mainly because large public companies need to grow. They need to add shareholder value. They need to create value for their shareholders. In order to do that, the easiest way is consolidation. Buy more companies. Build through acquisition and therefore verge into those areas where they can get those specialized skills in the marketplace. And so I think mergers will come up. The issue obviously is the multiples that you're often seeing. And in our practice, we kind of track the multiples and we've seen them as low as nine and as high as 12. This tax reform thing that's gonna come out is probably gonna impair that value somewhat. Vendors will always want to sell the shares of their companies. Unlike what we've seen in the past couple of years where most transactions could be some form of hybrid, some form of asset slash share deal. Going forward, because of the way integration is gonna work for the new rules, you'll be less likely wanting to sell the assets of the company. And so therefore this could be a potential issue for public companies going forward. They may use more of their stock as a form of currency in order to entice buyers to sell their business. Globalization becoming a greater threat. We're seeing more and more players, especially in the construction side of the industry, coming into the large infrastructure projects in Toronto and, ab and abroad. And this obviously is new you know, to our environment. Our landscape has changed as a result of that. And globalization is also bringing them with financial resources. Many of our engineering clients don't have the financial resources to carry out large engineering projects. They need those financial resources. This tax reform proposal preventing us to accumulate profits, income in our holding companies is an issue because we won't have the sustainability to help mitigate the risks on some of these larger projects and also have the cash resources to fund our own internal growth. Mega projects, sustainability, risk. We're seeing time and time again that many of the risks are being punted back to you and your organization. Municipalities are not assuming that risk. In fact, they're abdicating it to the engineering community. Have you priced that into your, into your service offering? And I would say many times that's not the case. And so therefore, again, you need these cash resources in order to mitigate the risk to help weather the storm should you have to fund those risks. These tax reform proposals may impair your ability to hold cash in your holding companies. So capabilities kind of talked about this mitigating risks, having the cash resources to do so. Talent, <coughs> clearly an issue. Where do you find it? How do you find it? Is always an issue that we find when it comes to talent. Acquisition may be part of that solution without a doubt. Excuse me, sorry, I got a frog. Clearly on the succession front, this is gonna become a bit of a challenge. On the succession front itself, we're gonna find the old methods in order to make succession tax effective 
becoming a problem. <coughs> it used to be there used to be various methods in order to entice new shareholders to their companies, and they were very tax effective. These new rules as being proposed will impair the ability to use some of those old techniques. And what will become important now going forward is to redesign how you invite new shareholders to become shareholders of your company. And that will take some new thoughtware, some new technology in order to help the succession plan overall. Tax reform. I wish the word was really tax reform. And I think the message out in the marketplace has been, it's really a cash grab. If there's one message you can bring to Parliament tomorrow to your MPs, is we should do tax reform. Two words, tax reform. Please undertake a process of tax reform, because that's what's really needed. <coughs> the government promised us on July 18 that they would start doing tax reform for private corporations. Not true. That's not what's happened. We've continued our patchwork of bandages to hold the tax system together that really doesn't really work in its entirety. And so the message you need to deliver to the MPs tomorrow is undertake tax reform. Truly do. Really don't be the message of just sticking up private companies and their owners for cash. Now they're believing that climate change and the like is really driving the economy and things like that, but really tax reform does if we could put more monies in your pockets to allocate to investments to drive growth. You know the investments will drive your industry. People making investments in infrastructure, people making investments in non-recreational developments, it's those investments that are important. Your threat is interest rates are rising. As interest rates continue to rise, people may not want to make those investments. But if they have cash available to themselves, they have that dry powder to make that investment, to mitigate their returns, <clears throat> that's an important thing. Small business drives our economy, and private owners drive our economy. So clearly, the government's heard from us, and clearly the government has said, there's concerns. They haven't heard at all. They need to hear more from yourselves, especially tomorrow when you're on, that we really do need tax reform. If we're really gonna challenge the taxation of private companies, Let's challenge that assertion. Let's challenge how it should be taxed and what you should earn in the circumstance and pay your reasonable rate of tax. Right now it seems to be we increase personal tax rates, we decrease the corporate tax rate, we introduce a small business deduction. Well, that just, just widens the gap. And when you widen the gap between the highest marginal rate and the effective tax rate in corporations, you're motivated to keep more money in the company. But there's this other rule, this passive income rule that they want to introduce to restrict how much you can actually accumulate in your company. Well, how do we reconcile between all those divergent objectives? Tax reform. We really need to undertake a proper system that, in, order to, in order to address this issue. So the farmers were clearly upset. The farmers were so upset, I think they would have had it hanging. Right? And Bill, Bill Morneau obviously listened to them. Concerns were obviously well respected that they can't transfer their businesses. But the issues of farmers equally apply to yourselves as business owners. The original rules as proposed would have impeded your ability to transfer your business to family members. In fact, it would have been impeded so much so it would have cost you double the tax. Not fair. That is improper tax reform. Now, the farmers had a larger voice than most of the community, and most farming businesses are transferred to the next generation. And so there was a response, and the response last week was they're going to repeal those rules for now. For now. They knew the original rules didn't work. They heard the farmers that they couldn't transfer their business tax effectively to their family members. You are equally impacted. You're family businesses that you wish to leave to your family members under the original proposals would have cost you double as much. And that's not right. They repealed those rules, like I say, for now. The trick is, for all of us, is to stay on them 
to say that type of tax reform that you're proposing, that private owners would be facing double the tax, is wrong. No one should be paying double the tax. We can all agree to pay our fair share, but not double. So sunny days, are they ahead? I'm not so sure. The driving engine behind tax reform is still missing. The driving engine behind changing the law to make it fair for private corporations should be there, should be reviewed. Right now, there seems to be a tendency to favor public companies. If you notice, these rules do not impact public companies at all. They're allowed to accumulate surplus cash, build their balance sheets, accumulate the cash resources to do those mergers and acquisitions, but we are not entirely a public company phenomenon. Our Canadian economy, 40% of it, is still based on the backbone of private businesses. They should have the same right to accumulate funds in order to expand their growth. So, will we make it work? We need to, we need to modify the vehicle. The vehicle clearly is broken at this point in time. It's lost its wheels, it's lost all, all the possible things it can have there. And we need to make change. The rules announced on July 18 were significant changes to the taxation of private companies. And this is just one of many rules that have happened over time. And what I mean by that is, when we looked at these rules, they started way back when. There were changes to the, how the small business deduction was allocated to private companies. In fact, they restricted it. And this clearly impacted many construction companies, your suppliers, many of the engineering companies that had different structures to multiply the small business deduction. They were all shut down. Then along came the rules of July 18, or even before that, the change in work in process. How those rules can impede how you claim work in progress for many professionals. And that rule changed. And then July 18 shows up, and again, they attack private corporations. There's a theme here. There's clearly a theme. There's a theme here that private corporations are under review by the Department of Finance and Bill Morno. So let's do it properly. Let's talk to each other. Let's actually spend the time to understand what is the issue and what do they want to circumvent in terms of what is the policy? What is the policy that they're looking to achieve? And that's one thing that I would try to ask you, you know, when you talk to the MPs tomorrow is, are we really gonna do tax reform? Are we gonna spend the time to really figure out what is important, consistent with policy, and then introduce legislation that is clear, fair, and predictable for taxpayers. Because if legislation isn't clear, fair, and predictable, how can you plan your affairs? How can you plan how your business will be transferred to the next generation? How can you plan who to invite to your company to expand and grow your options? How? How? Well, the right answer would be to undertake tax reform. And I know the quick answer you're going to get is, well, that's a lot of work. You're right. It is a lot of work. But isn't it the right answer? Isn't it the right answer? You know, the Carter Commission in the 60s took five years to come up with what we have today. And 45 years later, we've got a patchwork of tax reform proposals that is bleeding at the seams. And you're all engineers. If you keep cutting the pipe many, many, many times, it weakens. The joints can no longer hold. And that's what we have a system as today. The rules of July 18 highlight that inefficiency that they've said. Income sprinkling. So the original proposal was that if you had a spouse or children in your business, you couldn't pay them a dividend unless they were actively involved in the business. And there was a capital requirement test, and there was a labor component test. So you were all taking pictures of your son and daughters licking stamps. I guess you don't lick stamps anymore, right? But licking stamps, you know, you know vacuuming the office, sorting the paperwork, filing the, the drawings in, in the whatever cubby holes they are, because that was your way of demonstrating that they actually did some capital for the business. Absurd test, an absolutely absurd test. So subjective. How can legislation now be fair and predictable in the case? Now, this week they announced they're going to soften those rules. The four tests still remain, but they're going to soften the rules. What the heck does that mean? 
What does that mean? Either the tests belong or they don't belong. Remove the test. Talk about introducing legislation that's ambiguous, vague. If the tests exist and they continue to exist, why? Can you imagine dealing with the CRA auditor from Saskatoon to St. John's to Kelowna? We're never going to get consistency. Those auditors will interpret those four tests differently. What do we need? Truly, we need tax reform. Truly, what we need is to figure out a system that works for all of us. Can we start paying our spouses? We hope we can. We'll see this week when the legislation gets released that hopefully they will continue to pay or allow us to pay dividends to our significant others in our businesses. Can they allow us to continue to pay to our children? Maybe not. And I would say most of the communities kind of reconcile themselves at this point in time where, you know, if the kids really don't participate in the business and they haven't done anything meaningful, either by way of investment or by way of labor contribution, then maybe we shouldn't be paying them dividends, which is unfortunate for us. But let's say that was a tax benefit that say a lot of small business owners enjoyed over the period of time, we may not get on a go forward basis. But not being able to share your wealth with your family members, including your spouse, is just not consistent with policy. You're allowed to split your pension, but you can't split your earnings of your business with your spouse. Makes no sense, an inconsistency there for sure. Holding passive income, this is a very controversial issue. You know, there, there's stats, and whether they've been published or not, I'll tell you this. 1.8 million Canadian-controlled private corporations exist in Canada today. 1.8 million. Of the 1.8, 29,000 Canadian-controlled private corporations, 29,000 hold four, $400, billion, $400 billion of what they refer to as passive income. And that $400 billion earns about $26 billion of income, which the government currently receives 13 billion in tax. But they don't want that 400 billion to grow anymore. That is their policy motivation. They want to put a cap. And the cap they've introduced is this notional computation that the businesses, the passive income could only earn $50,000. And then when you have to do the 5% imputed rate of return, it equates to something like a gross capital of a million seven, million five in that range there. Is that enough? They're saying it is. They're saying that's all you'll ever be able to accumulate in your businesses as passive investment holdings. Unless you can demonstrate that the monies will continue to be used in the business in some fashion. That'll be an interesting conversation to have. And again, this legislation hasn't been out yet for us to decipher for us to look at, for us to really dissect to see what does this mean? How are you gonna draw this bright line test between income accumulated to help mitigate some of the risks that we talked about before? Engagement risk, professional risk, growth risk. How can we do that with maybe only 1.7 million of cash? Have really the dentists and the doctors really kind of overshadowed what real business is really out there to do? grow our Canadian economy, employ more people. So again, the message tomorrow is, let's really do tax reform. Stop this patchwork. What are we trying to get to? Right? Very simple message, I think, but powerful. The current legislation is not clear. Passive income for investment holding businesses like yourself to grow your business. How will you be able to compete against your big public company brother and sister? They can do this without restriction under tax policy. You cannot as a private owner, cannot. Significant differential. Maybe all the private companies should become public. Perhaps. Maybe that's a suggestion. Will that, will that be possible? Can that happen? Practically, who really knows the right answer? But probably not. But again, what is policy? What are we trying to achieve? Is this tax reform measure really going to achieve what we're hoping to do? Passive income is a, th is a real issue in this country. It is an issue for government because there's too much money sitting in 29,000 private corporations. And they believe these rules will only impair those 29,000 companies. But they'll never be 29,001. And does that allow the Canadian economy to grow? If we can't get a number of 29,001, 29,002, et cetera? That money is put to use somewhere. 
They've also said they allow investments to continue. They're not looking to impair joint ventures, venture capital type of investment, angel funding. How? We haven't got to that how just yet. We're looking to see what that how looks like in the case. Converting income to capital gains was the third measure that they had introduced. And then they repealed it. And this was actually very controversial because it definitely impaired the ability to transfer family businesses intergenerationally. It impaired everybody's estate. Typically, when you, if a shareholder dies owning shares of a private corporation, you have a tax on death. Deemed disposition, you have a tax on death on the value of your shares. The proposed rules originally enacted would basically cause, or potentially cause, double tax on death. Again, a very unfair practice. You may hear tomorrow these, these were unintended consequences. Unintended consequences of the original proposals. That's an interesting concept. Unintended consequences. You know, they're drafters of the legislation. And they didn't anticipate the potential impact to two-thirds of the engineering community that are private owners either selling their businesses or potentially passing away owning the shares of their business. They didn't anticipate that. They also didn't anticipate that to all the farmers in Canada. They also didn't anticipate that to all the other small business owners in Canada. They almost represent 45% of the GDP in Canada. They didn't anticipate that. Unintended consequences. Thankfully for us, they repealed that law. Well, at least they're not proceeding with the proposal. The question is, they still have uncertainty. They still have uncertainty as to what they do want to put forward. And clearly, there have been some abuses using some of these old rules, and they want to close down what they refer to as surplus stripping, where owners are able to extract funds out of the company very tax effectively with little or no tax, and that they found offensive. And I think we can all agree, we concur. That practice of being able to extract it at a beneficial rate, a very beneficial rate, should be curtailed to be consistent with the policy that we all should pay a fair amount of tax. But it shouldn't double the tax on death, and it shouldn't double the tax when you try to sell your business. And these three rules are, are very problematic. Although they have been somewhat tweaked, we really haven't seen the legislation as of yet. What will it look like? We'll have to wait and see. But in the next couple of weeks, it'll be very, very interesting. And there's still many, many, many unanswered questions. If you, if you previously, what we call freeze or froze the value of your company, and you started to redeem those, which is part of one typical engineering company succession plan, where the founders maybe freeze their value, cap their value in preferred shares, and then over time take their capital back by redeeming those shares, if you're no longer active in the business, you could be adversely affected by these rules, as even proposed. And we see this many times, where the founders have now taken back a fixed value preferred share, and now are being paid out, out of the future earnings of the company, but are no longer coming to the office every day, or no longer contributing to the growth of the business, because they've passed that on. They may be adversely affected when they start to receive that redemption dividend when they start to receive their proceeds back on those preferred shares. That has not been addressed even under the proposed rules. So there's still very many answer, unanswered questions. As you go to the Hill tomorrow, charge up to the Hill and demand these MPs to start to listen, not only to the farmers, but also to yourselves. It is important that we do take proper tax reform, that we properly assess what is the policy and how do we all help as Canadians? We get this. We understand what we need to contribute. But let's do this collectively. Let's do this together. Let's figure out a policy that works so that it's fair, equitable, and predictable. I'll open up to any questions you may have. And don't bring out the blue bucket. None? Wow, go ahead, thanks. Yeah, it's finance. Yeah, so as I understand it, uh, this undercurrent about, especially on the taxing on passive income, 
has been uh, in, par in the Department of Finance for many years and with many uh, parties. And in fact, I think uh, there's a story I was told. I mean, uh, the late uh, Flaherty, when he was finance minister, this proposal was posed to him, and uh, he just chose not to proceed on it. So this is a Department of Finance initiative, without a doubt, uh, that they're pushing forward on, and they're trying to get somebody to listen. And uh, the PMO will tell you that what they're trying to do is consistent with their uh, platform, that they want to help out middle, middle class Canadians. Um, you know, some people would say they've, they've created a bit of a class warfare. That's politics. I'm not a politician. Uh, but clearly, you know, there is a problem in the system, which I think we're all trying to acknowledge and we're trying to recognize. Is this the right answer for it? I would say personally, no, right? That, that there's probably a better way to do this. Uh, and, and the administration of this is going to be huge, absolutely amount. As accountants, my partners, Doug McClarty and John Hughes, we're ecstatic, right? Because the amount of complexity we're going to have to come back to you with, you know, we're going to have to track the original portfolio, how much money does it make, right? Because what they're saying to us is that you'll be able to ring fence, right? We're going to put up a big wall. No, I sound like Trump. We're going to put up a big wall around your original money, and then you're going to be able to monitor that growth, and that growth will be under the existing rules, and all income from that monies will always be under the existing rules. Right? Like, talk about the administration. It's going to be massive. Right? And then new monies go into a separate pot, right, to separate pot subject to whatever the future rules are going to be, and even that's subject to a cap, right, because there's going to be this imputed 5% negative, you know, you've got to figure out what the total principal would be, which could equate to about a million and a half dollars. And then you got the third pot, because once you exceed the new pool, then anything excess was subject to the new rules. So we got the old, the current, and then the future. So as accountants, we got jobs forever, right? Like, this is gonna be fantastic, right, I must say. Selfishly, great, practically speaking, terrible solution. We probably could get to a better answer. The short-term thinkers, right? They're, they're very much short-term thinkers. They, they are not thinking for the greater good here, right? The reality is a parallel project needs to be undertaken, right? And they'll argue they don't have budget to do that, but yet no staffer has been repaid. You know, they've got a great payroll system. No one's getting paid, right? Uh, we're saving a lot of money. We're saving, yeah, yeah. So last